Salon. I, I believe this is our fourth, three post-COVID, one pre-COVID. We plan to do more, obviously, in the future. Uh, my name is Cliff Young, and I am the president of Ipsos Public Affairs here in the U.S., and we have a great event. We have some great panelists, an incredible keynote speaker. We're going to talk about a really important issue of the day, gender in the workplace. Um, this affects us uh, everywhere um, in all domains and all dimensions. It's central to our lives, right? It's related to our to our personal lives and our professional lives, et cetera. Just a couple notes, and I'll, like I said, I'll hand it over. Uh, first and foremost, what is Ipsos? For some of you that don't know what an Ipsos is, it's a, it's a global market and social research company. Uh, we have approximately 20,000 employees in 90 countries, so we cover the globe. And our primary purpose is to do what? It's to provide information on what people think and do to decision makers in all the, in all the senses across all the domains, right? I ultimately always say we bring voice to people. That is, we give the decision maker the context to make his or her decision. And, you know, I, I think it's not just me. I think many who do what we do would say it's a noble cause, right? And so on the salons, um, like I said, this is our fourth salon. What's our objective here? To bring voice to people, to provide context on the most important issues of the day, obviously. And you know, a, a salon is a cool thing, in my opinion, right? Usually we go to events. We've got our panelists sitting up there. They're all august and distant, not very proximate to us. They talk and they leave. And a salon isn't that. It's very asymmetrical, right? A salon is very symmetrical. It's cozy. It's small. Uh, we can talk about the issue, and after that, the experts or the panelists can mingle with the crowd. Very much <laughs> and very similar to the days of old, right? In, in London or Paris, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries, you had the salons where ideas were bantered about. You would talk about zoology on the one hand and philosophy on the other. Very interesting combination, especially when you're talking about humans. Um, and that's what we want. So hopefully um, we get a bit of that, a bit of that feel, a bit of that context. And what I can say is after the panel is over, the panelists will mingle, have some drinks, have some eats, and we can engage them and ask them those really difficult questions that you were too embarrassed to ask uh, otherwise. So with that, I want to introduce our keynote speaker, Kelly Beaver. Uh, she is uh, chief executive uh, of Ipsos UK and Ireland. They go together. And uh, she's many things. She's an incredible leader, has really driven that business forward, very dynamic. Um, she is passionate about the subject matter, work, you know, gender in the workplace, gender issues. She's worked with it her entire career. She's very close, I want to say, to the the Prince of Wales office. I believe I got that right. I'm not quite sure. I could have gotten that wrong. She can correct me, but it's super cool if you think about it. She discusses these sorts of issues uh, with the most important decision makers <clears throat> in her country. And I think the last point is, if you're ever over there in the UK, you turn on the, what? Telly, as we call it, the telly, you just might see her. So with that, I introduce Kelly Beaver. Thank you. an introduction. Thank you, Cliff. Well, it's brilliant to be here with you all. And actually, being in a room talking about gender equality after researching it for such a long time, I'm delighted to see as many men in the audience. I don't normally get an audience filled with men for this particular topic, so that's fabulous. 
And often they are quite depressing seminars that I give. But today I'm going to start with a little bit of optimism first of all because we have made progress. There is more gender diversity in the workplace today than there was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I think it is worth really stating that before I go on to tell you where we still need to make some progress. We do have more women now on boards, we have more women on the C at the C-suite level and there's some really f fabulous moments over the last even just 12 months where we have seen some really prominent positions in life now led by women. For example, the Wall Street Journal got its first female editor-in-chief, Emma Tucker, that's an absolute milestone and Jane Champion was the first woman for Best Director at the Oscars twice. In the UK, we also had female footballers, which is a, a massive thing in our household. My eight-year-old daughter absolutely loves football, and now we have a female team in the UK to look up to. So in all walks of professional life, now we are seeing females and males in leadership positions. And the work we've done at Ipsos also shows that people are becoming more optimistic about the future. More people now believe that their lives as females and their daughters' lives are going to be better than that of their parents. That's a big shift than what we were seeing even a matter of years ago. So the question really is, do we still need to bother talking about gender equality in the workplace? Is it still a problem? Some people don't think so. And we did some work recently with the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in the UK, which is led by Julia Gillard, the previous and first Prime Minister who was female in Australia. And that study showed that actually, in particular men, but also those in the younger generations, no longer think that it's as important uh, an issue. And they're also starting to really worry about the negative impacts. Six in 10 men globally now believe that gender equality has gone too far in their country. And that's something that resonates also in developed nations such as the UK and the US. So we are seeing some level, in particular amongst young people, of backlash against gender equality and what it's doing in the workplace to diversity and equality of opportunity for men as well as women. One of the other things is that actually globally inequality of gen gender inequality is no longer the top equality issue that we perceive that we're facing. Income and regional inequality is much more important to the global population. They're much more worried about that. Gender equality isn't even a top five issue. So for some people, they think the job is done. But is the job done? Well, no it isn't. Many of us still believe that gender equality in the workplace and just more broadly across society, there is plenty left to do. And some of the studies that we have done recently and that others have done have demonstrated that there are a few critical areas where there is still significant room for improvement. One of these is a new area, inflation. Did you know that inflation affects women more than men? Do you know why? You know. So there's been a range of studies done looking at the inflation of different commodities and actually for women there's something different about what we purchase than what our male counterparts are purchasing. That means that inflation is heavier on females than it is women. So if we want to guess what women buy more of, perhaps spend a bit more money on, that may be rising astronomically in price. Food, clothes. It's shoes. <laughs> shoes. 75% price rise in the price of women's shoes. Who knew? But it's a substantive and big offender. Also, women are more still more likely to experience adverse incidents in the workplace, so whether they are sexual or verbal. And we see this in some of the longer term trends that are collected across both Europe and also here in the US. 50% of women would say that they have experienced something of an adverse verbal or physical or unwanted sexual attention in the last 12 months. And also something that's very close to my heart as a leader in a business, about implicit bias that we see in the workplace. And there's a fabulous book, if you ever have time, you can read it, by Mary Ann Sieghart, who writes something called the, it's a book called The Authority Gap. And she talks about some of the hurdles that women face in the workplace, which are very hidden and very subtle. Studies, for example, where you have identical CVs are rated more highly when there's a man's name on top. Women are more likely to be interrupted in a meeting and spoke over. They're likely to have their authority questioned and be viewed as less intelligent. There is academic evidence of those things. So that is still a significant issue. And it's perceptions as well. Three in five now feel that in general women have more or less, they have less opportunities to succeed than men with equal competency and two in five believe that women have less opportunities than men to become entrepreneurs. 
there is a perception still that women are disadvantaged in the workplace. One of the trends that we've looked at over time is the volume of women entering the labour market. It is substantially more than it was in the 1960s. But what has also risen with women entering the workforce at scale is the number of people who say they answer yes to this in the study, that they are feeling spent or used up at the end of the day. And there is a correlation between those two factors. Women are more likely in the US to say they're often or always burnt out at work, and there is an aspect of this which of course relates to caring responsibilities. And I don't think I could talk about gender in the workplace and talk about the experience of both of the sexes without touching briefly on the experience of women and care. Women are more likely to have caring responsibilities. There is significant evidence of this. We've done a fabulous study in the UK called Who Cares? And we've measured the overall population who believe that they are taking on a caring responsibility, whether that's young children, or uh, an ageing parent, or somebody who's at a different life stage but needs support. Four in ten women, comparatively to just under a third of men, say that they have some level of caring responsibility. And also, women are much more likely to believe they do their fair share of caring responsibilities and picking up that emotional labour uh, than their male counterparts, 52% compared to 10% of men. Indeed, over the course of the pandemic, we in the UK, and I think here in the US as well, also saw signals of the she session. Women stepping back from the workforce, not stepping up for progression, not stepping forward, but stepping back, stepping out, going part-time because of the, the needs to juggle other responsibilities in the home. But even before COVID, we knew that fewer mothers were returning to work and full-time employment after they had had their children. And that is quite a significant reason behind that is actually the cost of childcare, both here in the US and also in the UK. There has been some progress in the UK over the last few years. I'm not sure about, and maybe one of our panellists will cover this, about the amount of childcare cost coverage here in the US. I'd say it'd probably be lagging. But in the UK, we now have a new policy the government has brought in to help provide care costs for children with, uh, under the ages of two, which is quite substantive. So... One of the things that I think is one of the new areas for gender equality challenge in the workplace is around hybrid working. Now this is something that I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about. It's a bit of a double-edged sword. We're now in an environment where there is a lot more flexibility in how we work and how we come to work. And that flexibility is something that women are statistically more likely to take up than their male counterparts. And that's fabulous because it allows them to reduce that burnout to manage the flexibility that they need as part of their work and home lives. But actually it also makes them less visible. And in a study conducted by Deloitte, six out of ten women who were working in a hybrid way said they felt excluded from meetings or interactions, and half said they don't have exposure to leaders. And I think the joy of the flexibility may also inhibit career progression for women and those women being able to step forward. And I think that's something we're going to see come out after the hybrid working delight starts to fade. So I think just three last points, if I may. We have made progress, so I didn't want to be all doom and gloom. There's substantive progress, and as a result of that, it has made it a bit uncomfortable for some individuals. So we are seeing discomfort start to come through from younger generations and also men in our data, which was mostly anecdotal before, but it's coming through in the harder stats now. That complacency amongst the younger generations Actually, they're going to be facing new and different challenges, in particular with this hybrid working piece, which is last, last likely to continue. But there are a rising number of beacons in public life, individuals who do stand for progress and equality, and they have a huge role to play in helping to change the game. Thank you very much. Okay, so before, before I call up... Thank you so much, Kelvin. And before I call up all the panelists, which would be great, I just want to uh, introduce two people. Um, we have some guests, Ipsos guests here. And the first one is Kathy Bachman. She's our Chief Performance Officer. I'll practice the British language. <laughs> I'm not British. And Lorenzo Larini, our CEO. Thank you so much for being here. And with that, Mallory and, and company, the floor is yours. I'm a vice president with 
within Ipsos's public affairs practice. I, there we go. Um, I specialize in conducting research for public consumption. So all of Ipsos's research that you see in the media here in the US, um, as well as folks in the private sector sort of looking to showcase their expertise on a given topic. And really, as Cliff said, lend voice to people. So um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today, and it's a pleasure to be here with my panelists. Before I introduce them, one of our panelists sadly is missing, um, Congresswoman Jennifer McClellan. Um, scheduling did not align, and the House is in session voting on the floor right now, but she did want to send some remarks, as this is an issue that she has championed throughout her career and is very passionate on. So we'll hear from the Congresswoman first, and then we'll kick it live to our panel. discussion at the IMSA's DC Salon. <laughs> Unfortunately, tonight's vote schedule conflicted with the event at Cafe Away. However, I wanted to take a moment to bring virtual greetings, and I hope you have a productive and informative panel on gender dynamics in the workplace. As the first black woman to represent Virginia in Congress, a working mother with two young children, and the first woman to become pregnant while serving in the Virginia House of Delegates, I'm very cognizant of the work we have left to do to achieve gender equality, especially in the workplace. I work at the state level through such legislation as the Pregnant Work Fairness Act, legislation to allow women to breastfeed uh, at work, uh, also legislation to allow teachers to breastfeed while at school. These issues in the General Assembly that I led on, I am bringing with me to Congress. And in fact, yesterday, I helped launch the first ever, ever Equal Rights Amendment Caucus and will serve as one of the vice chairs, just as I led the fight to ratify the ERA in Virginia, making us the 38th state. These and other issues will help to make sure that women in the workplace don't have to have their gender impact their ability to work. Thank you for your leadership and creating a space to have this important discussion. And please know you have a partner in this fight in Congress. Take care. All right, I'd like to start by introducing our other panelists. We've already heard from Kelly this evening. Uh, directly to my left is Carolyn Lee. She is the President and Executive Director of the Manufacturing Institute. And to my far left is Sarah Hackey Bird, who is the CEO of Women Moving Millions. Thank you all for being part of this discussion tonight. Um, to start, I think first we need to address that gender equality in the workplace is a broad umbrella, term and topic. Gender inequality takes many forms. So to begin, I'd really just like to start by hearing each of your personal experiences, your, your testimonials, if you will. Why is advancing gender equality in the workplace so important to each of you? Um, I'll start with Carolyn. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Mallory, and everybody for having us, and, and very interesting to hear some of the very same challenges from across the pond. Um, so I'm Carolyn Lee. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Manufacturing Institute. The Institute is the Workforce Development and Education Affiliate for the National Association of Manufacturers. So as you might imagine from the name, uh, we focus on manufacturing as a sector. So we are uh, about 13 million people now in the U.S. are in manufacturing, and only about 29% of them are women. And so for us as a sector where we are a significant part of the American economy, we are significant uh, players in communities all across. There is not a community in America that does not have manufacturing presence. And so when you look at the economic value of manufacturing careers and the long, durable careers that come and the high paying, where higher pay on average uh, for non-farm than at most other sectors, and, that incl and they include benefits, so uh, retirement benefits and healthcare benefits Benefits. So it's a really well-paying job, and only about half of them require four-year degrees or beyond. So it's a very equalizing job with lots of opportunities. So if we look at that, and we have, I should say, about 800,000 open jobs every month for the last year, only having 30% of women in the sector is women are then our largest talent opportunity. So we've been working on this uh, for over 10 years now. Started with a study we did with Deloitte, and you mentioned a Deloitte study earlier, great research partners with us. And what we found was that women told us, uh, and at the time I should say it was under 25% of the sector were made up of women in the workforce. And what we heard was is that they weren't coming or staying because they didn't have the role models and the network 
and that support in the community to be part of the sector. There's a perception that manufacturing is uh, old, white, and male, and we are. We are an older, whiter, more male dominated sector than most other parts of the economy. And so when women would come in, there was a lot of conversation about the lonely only. You're the only one in the room. People don't look like you. And so the sector has really paid a lot of attention and spent a lot of time working in the last decade on how do you close the gender gap, being our largest talent opportunity. So this is something we're coming at from all, all sides. This is about perception of the sector, which is a great challenge for us. But it's really about making sure that there are opportunities. And so in today's world, as, as Kelly talked about a few minutes ago, it's things like flexibility. It's things like access to care. It's things about making sure that there is uh, equal opportunity and equal reach and equal support that if you really basic things there is a women's locker room or a women's restroom nearby so that you're not having to run you know all the way back to the headquarters building to be able to go find you know, facilities that that suit your needs so it's small things like that and then large things to make sure that we're building inroads for both genders to be able to come in and and build those inroads to well-paying careers and so this is a kind of an all of the above approach for us and so hopefully that sets it up i could go on keep going but i know we're just at the start here so i'll, I'll turn to the next one thanks sarah over to you <clears throat> great well i'm so delighted to be here today and have long been a fan of cliff's thought leadership so was really thrilled to be included in today's conversation um, I am the CEO of Women Moving Millions. Women Moving Millions is the largest philanthropic community globally of high net worth women. Um, we're standing at nearly 400 globally um, who have made and prioritized um, giving to women and girls and gender equality work in their philanthropy. So members make a million dollar commitment uh, to give to gender equality work and then we, they then become part of our membership community. So we are, as an organization, a convener, we are an educator, um, and we serve in a resource advocacy role. We fundamentally believe that in order to close the gender inequality gap, that we actually have to drive more resources to the leaders on the front lines who can pa do policy change, can, can advocate locally, um, and improve both their communities and um, the laws in their country in order to ensure that women are able to really thrive and prosper. Um, so really thrilled to be here. My, um, in terms of how I came to this work, um, I have a very strong mother, um, very strong women in my family, and um, grew up in the 70s and know what that context was like for women working. I heard about it, my mom exposed it to me. Um, I understand both the financial barriers um, that used to exist from a structural perspective, in addition to the cultural um, and, and behavioral and attitudinal barriers that continue to exist and prevent progress. Um, so I grew up in it and I um, have worked my way through it um, in terms of my feminist journey, um, but do fundamentally believe that in order for us um, to make progress, we do need to look at every sector in society. Um, it's, it is a capital issue, it's a, it's a political will issue, but it's also really a cultural issue that we have to get over. And so I've been raised um, bread and butter on, on that, um, that idea and um, have committed my career for the last 25 years to working in the nonprofit sector, really at the intersection of human rights and democracy. Um, and I think today we can look all around the world, including in this country, and we can see the backsliding in women's rights. And, uh, and so I really think that gender equality is actually at the center of healthy democracies all around the world. Um, so I think in order for us to ensure that we as a country thrive, that we that democracy survives globally, we have to put gender equality, um, gender equality at work at the heart of all our agendas. So at Ipsos in the UK, we have about 2,000 staff, and we don't actually have a problem with our proportion of females. We're a 60% female organization. The problem is what happens when they reach their early 30s, and they decide they want to have a family. And we find at that stage, we find women are stepping back, 
And we also found that the pay gap was starting to translate into our salary figures. So we measure the pay gap, we report on our pay gap in the UK. We also do it for our ethnic pay gap and our, our female uh, gender pay gap. So there was a real challenge that we had there. And one of the problems also was that our men were not afforded the same rights as females when they had a child. And if we want women to achieve equality in the workforce, men have to be able to achieve equality at home. And so it's not all about giving to the women. And one of the first things that we did was bring in a shared and equal parental leave, where at the point at which a baby is born to a couple, the man, if he works for us, can get the same amount of paternity leave as his wife can get in her organisation which is one of the few com companies in the UK doing this, but this is at the forefront of progression. Our men now have three children. They don't have two. Some of the ones who've up took it. But there's a real cultural challenge, even when those kind of policies are in place, where people don't feel empowered to access them. But it is also meaning now that our, our women, when they have children, they have an expectation of their partners, and our men have the ability to support their wives or their partners as and when they have children too. So that's been a fundamental shift. It's not feeding into the pay gap quickly, but it will do over time, and it will make a bit of a difference. But we need more organisations in the UK to do the same. So that was one of our challenges. I myself took, in the UK it's unheard of, but I took four months off. I know here that's like a lifetime, you know, that's a huge amount of time. But in the UK people normally take a year. I took four months off and my husband looked after my child from the period when she was four months old through to when she was eight months old. He wished he hadn't, it's not a pleasant time. <laughs> However, it had helped enforce his bond and it allowed me to go back to work earlier and to progress my career. And so I'm really passionate about putting in place policies for our workforce where we level, we're helping to level up the men at home so our women can be leveled up in the workplace because I think it's a little bit about giving to the men as well. The challenge is when, when I brought that policy in, oh my God, the women, the senior women were saying, why are you giving men all this time off? I said, honestly, we're feeding into the system. This is a really progressive change, and it will improve things in the longer term. But right now, it, it did feel a bit counterintuitive for our females for us to be bringing in a paternity leave policy for men, which was very generous. But it is positive. Absolutely. And, and I do want to come back to that, the role that men have to play in gender equality in the workforce. But, but first, and some of you started to touch on this, You know, obviously the three of you represent um, sectors or positions where women are vastly underrepresented, whether it be manufacturing, philanthropic giving, or in the C-suite. And I'd like to just for each of you to kind of build on your own experiences. I'm curious, what are some of the biggest shifts over time you've seen? You know, we're, we're going to talk a lot about progress this evening, both where we've been and where we need to go. So I want to start with where we've been. In your experience, what are some of the biggest strides in, say, the past five, ten years that we have made in gender equality in the workplace? Because Kelly, as you said, there, there is progress being made, right? So I, I'd like to hear just some of the biggest shifts in your mind that signal to us, you know, we are moving in the right direction. What does that look like? Sarah, I'll start with you. Um, well, I think closing the pay gap is one of the biggest um, triumphs, but the problem is for every one woman that's promoted to leave the workforce. So we have this tremendous pipeline issue happening um, because of the experiences and the unsupportive cultures that still exist um, in the work port, the workforce for for women. Um, so I think we've we've done a lot in that regard, um, but still have a, a lot of progress to go um, as it relates to building in fully a care infrastructure to be able to support women so that they can stay in the workforce and we don't have that m massive exodus. Um, I do think the attention, I think, you know, COVID has obviously illuminated um, all of the issues that are holding women back that we've talked about here. Um, and so in terms of our day-to-day -day conversation, I think we're at the beginning of that moment of, 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 of real cultural wave of change that I do think is really possible, that we're aware of these problems. We have new language around these problems. Um, and so while we haven't been able to make progress in this country as it relates to congressional action, we are talking about it. We are aware of it. There are a lot of solutions and in, in, in indexes and everything else that we can measure these things now and tools for um, corporations to deploy in the workforce. 
that in, 10 years ago, nobody was even talking about those things when I started my career. So I do think we've made a lot of progress on the cultural side in terms of how the C-suite is thinking about how do you manage talent, how do you keep talent with women being over 50% of the workforce. That's massive. Um, so I think the value and the understanding of the value is there, but I just don't think we've, we've gone for far enough yet. So I think that's a really good response. First of all, a really good response, because what we're seeing in the data, as I said, is now we're reaching the point where the talk, we're leading to, it's leading to discomfort amongst people in the workforce. They're actually feeling discomfort about the level of change that they're seeing around them, because change is a wee bit uncomfortable. And it's beyond, getting beyond that now, where actually fundamental structural changes need to happen, like new policies from government, new support from government, new policies at the employer level. And that's when that, that is the point at which we're at. We have this tipping point right now as a result of some of the issues that have been exposed throughout COVID, but also the level of gender equality in the workforce now has improved quite substantively. Some of the things I spoke about, like people in very prominent leadership positions, the sheer volume of women in the workforce today has risen substantively. It went back a wee bit globally because of the pandemic and the after effects. But now we're at the point where we need to put the, the actual structure in place to push past the discomfort. So um, I, building on what both you said, because there, there's so much, um, there is progress and, and you're right. We're not, we're not there yet. I don't want to like, you know, we can applaud and then leave. We, we have work to do, but I think the trends and COVID in a way accelerated uh, so much. I mean, the, the narrative now talking about ch access to childcare, talking about equal leave, talking about flexibility, and this is this is very heavy in our sector, but it's throughout the entire economy because this is now table stakes to have workers work. We actually have a big gap for um, white males who don't have a college degree and are prime working age who are not working, who are like sitting on the sideline now. And actually in our sector, women, more women are working. We had a drop off uh, during COVID and now they, it has bounced back. And so there is just now, a, it is essential to have these conversations. And so, you know, much progress still needs to continue, but now this is the mainstream conversation. And I can't, I can't even, you know, imagine that several years ago. So if there can be any silver linings from COVID, it's still a horrible experience for the entire world and so many unnecessary deaths here in the US. We, we sit here and go, okay, well now it has changed the conversation. And so for companies that we deal with each and every day, they are looking to make changes to make sure that they are they are meeting the need. And that is, is kind of leveling it off. Way back in, in early in my career, I worked um, on um, Capitol Hill and I was at, worked in the House and I worked in the Senate. And I worked for women and members in, in both sides. And I ran the Congressional Women's Caucus. A long, long time ago, I was the lead staffer on the on one side. And what was interesting was, is that it was like, it was like a rarity to have these conversations and well, we didn't want to talk about some of these things because it was too controversial. When I went over to work in the Senate, the Senator work I worked for had told me that, you know, um, and I didn't know this, I grew up in the 70s, was born in the mid 70s, NIH just did research on men and they figured women were small men and therefore there wasn't women's health research and I remember thinking this is this doesn't make any sense so like we have come a long way it is shocking that we have to do it you know it's interesting we have a large women's initiative our uh, women make America initiative and and our our icon for it our um, our, our you know communications logos for it it's Rosie the Riveter so you know it was the women who were the backbone of the American economy who rose to the need when the men were sent to war to fight World War II, right? The arsenal of democracy, and women were at the center of it. And then after the war, you know, women kind of went back home, and there's all these, you know, social reasons for it, and, and lots of history written about it. But now we're resurgent again with, with the opportunity. But we have to make sure that the supports are there to do that. And I think that there are really, there is some really good progress being made, you know, in, in many fields, unfortunately not in all fields, to help us get there. And so now it's a question of how do we get there. Actually, I think, Sarah, what, you got, what you're doing is fascinating because we know the gap 
for women in philanthropy, but also women entrepreneurship, and how women can support women doing that is is difference making. And that goes to what we've seen on our side with having the role models, having the role models for the next level job. It's not just you know the iconic women, Mary Vera, you know Ginny Romnetti. It's not ju it's not only the CEOs who are very public figures who are women in our sector, but it's also having that next level up because you can't be what you can't see and you need to be able to put those role models out there so you can strive to do that because the glass shatterers are a rare breed and you know how do we how do we help fuel that and so there's a lot of things it's not it's not only the change at the top although we absolutely need that too it's all the changes throughout that can help us build that that step and i think we're i feel like we're it's getting better you know i feel like we're making progress I love ending on I a, a hopeful so note. We just, we just stopped there. Buddy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, let's talk about the men. Yeah? <laughs> um, because we are a research company, this is backed by data. Um, Ipsos recently released some research on International Women's Day. Um, global research, but I'm going to hone in on the U.S. for the purposes of our discussion. And um, in that poll, we found that three in five Americans believe that we won't achieve gender equality unless men take action too, right? Um, says the panel of women. But uh, so I think, you know, we've seen in the last several years, post George Floyd, we saw corporations respond by making a couple billion dollars worth of pledges to. Uh, invest in racial equality. Uh, we've, we saw after uh, Roe, we saw corporations implement policies to help women travel for abortions. I bring that up because there's a lot that companies can do. So we talk about well, where's Congress, what's Congress going to do, are they going to implement legislation that mandates nationally um, a, a care economy, infrastructure, safety, etc. for women and for families. Um, well, you know what, there's a lot that companies can actually do. Um, and a lot of that, like I liken some of that responsiveness while appreciated to a little bit like disaster philanthropy. Let's just throw money at the problem and we're not gonna actually embed structural changes. So there's no reason that a company doesn't like in the UK, can't make a decision to extend, to improve, to make their parental leave more equitable, to invest in childcare so families can stay in the workplace. That doesn't need to be legislated. That's something that a company can do and that there is some leadership on, there should be more leadership around it, but I think it's really corporate policy that should be changing and not waiting for Congress, which hasn't been getting a ton done. Um, but I'm not from DC, I came down to New York, so you're, you're all the experts. But I do think that we need to look more to corporations and because only 10% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women right now, which is a reduction. So everyone we lose, we reduce that number. We really do need male corporate CEOs and men in the C-suite to understand that it is their responsibility to actually build a care economy and a more equitable, supportive, inclusive economy, really for all people, not just women. I think if you invest in gender equity, you're gonna see all these other things improve. Um, but we've got to see corporate leadership on it. And yeah. I think, if I can jump in quickly, we also need to see men take advantage of these policies, right? Men taking the parental leave, the full length of parental leave that they're given, to show that you know men need as much time off as For women. sure. I will tell you, on, on the way down um, from my hotel room in the elevator, there was a... Um, a uh, gentleman who's talking to his colleague. I won't remember, I w will not mention the major global consumer brand that he was representing, but he said, It's so amazing. We offer now eight weeks of parental leave for men. And the woman in the elevator said, well, did, did he take it? And he said, he did, he took it. And I was like, this is so great that I'm listening to this conversation going to this panel, because it's true. Also, men need to see themselves in that role. And I do think that there's a lot of men who, under, who would love to spend more time at home in the beginning, but also don't feel, feel the pressure in terms of 
you know, their colleagues and in the workplace and how they're evaluated that they can't actually feel safe to do it. Yeah, it's, it's um, right, right after I had my third child at, and I was at my, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers before I switched to this role, uh, they changed the parental leave. And I was like, ah, maybe I should have another kid. I'm not having another kid. But they had changed it and then they added for, for parental leave for both parents and also added adoption benefits and also added fertility benefits in the healthcare. And, you know, our CEO is openly gay and he has three wonderful, beautiful children and his husband stays home with them and he talks about it as he has the responsibility too. I travel about half the time. My husband, I mean, actually, I mean, here's a great example. My father, his whole career in manufacturing, and I call this and I'm going to get this new job. I'm going to lead this organization. And he said, well, what about your kids? And I said, I'm going to have to sell them, Dad. I mean, uh, I hope this isn't very... And, and he said, what? And I said, well, you know, they're really cute. I guess I can get all... Dad, what do you think? Like, my Tim's going to stay home. My husband's going to stay and help. And, and you know, my and it's funny because we, we face those little things. And I said, and I go, you, you raised me. I could go do anything. And I went and worked on the hill and I did all these things. And the first thing you say to me when I tell you what I'm going to do this new great thing for the sector is what about your kids and that is like we need yes we need corporate leadership but we also need community leadership and we need families and we need women having this conversation and, and partners and spouses and we have to I mean, we'd be we would be yelling in a room by ourselves if we don't bring the men into the conversation and other allies, other underrepresented groups who have faced similar battles. And maybe there are things that women, because it is such a large majority, can conquer that then helps others in the LGBTQ plus community or in other underrepresented communities who face challenges and we can help with equality by doing so, right? And, and so it's the how do you normalize the conversations? But that's why I'm so, I don't know. I, I lived in DC a long time. I'm not normally, you know, it's not like we're a boomingly optimistic city, but it is, um, we're having the conversations. And so, and one thing that I have to talk about when you talk about allyship, because this has come up a few times, which is, you know, this idea that, you know, because of the Me Too movement, now we've, I've heard from a, a conversation of, well, now men are afraid to step up and be, and I think that that is a, is, is a fallacy. And, you know, the one thing has nothing to do with the other. You can be a sponsor and an ally and a mentor, and that is an entirely different thing from uh, being inappropriate or harassing an individual. And you can't say, I'm afraid of this, and therefore I'm not going to do that at all. And so we have to talk about that and put that to bed and say, okay, be appropriate and then be an ally, right, and then be an advocate because that is essential as we can't get there. Absolutely. Well said. Um, I did some qualitative research recently, um, interviews among people under 30 about dating and romantic relationships. And um, total tangent, but something you said sparked this. One of the most striking and alarming findings was when you ask young men if the Me Too movement has impacted their behavior toward dating and relationships. More often than not in these interviews, I had to kind of give them a reminder about what the Me Too movement is and what all took place. Whereas the young women were like, here's my checklist of what I do when I go on a date, this, 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 and this, and I send my location, and I think about behavior and consent, and I talk about consent. And the gender gap in awareness, let alone behavior or how we are talking about it is striking. And so in this push-pull that we're in of we've come so far and we have so far to go, I think that is that was a recent very striking reminder for me. Now, I do want to spend some time talking about legislation. Obviously, we have touched on what we as individuals can do, what corporations can do. Um, and yet, we, we do not have paid family leave at the federal level in this country. Obviously, there has been a lot more talk in recent years, which is wonderful. But oftentimes, those pushing for paid family leave, those pushing for legislation around childcare, reducing the cost of childcare, which whew, is tough. I have a three-year-old. Um, and, and other policies that help not only just working women, but working parents in general, many of these policies have been pushed forward by women lawmakers. So I guess my question is in two parts. But to start, why is it primarily women leading on this issue? Is it that women lead differently, perhaps? Or what do you all think about that? 
Well, I, I think women do lead differently, but I'm not sure that the two are the same. Um, and I, I think live, lived experience is, is everything, right? And that's why we need greater representation in Congress. Um, when you get greater representation, you have more diverse conversations, and the decision making um, is more inclusive. So of course women are gonna be the ones who are saying, what about families? What about women? Um, and pushing that conversation forward. And sometimes that's just part, of, I mean, it's just part of the journey. Um, and I thank all of the women who have been carrying that mantle um, and, and are prioritizing um, you know, their leadership. They're carving out a part of their leadership for this. And I think that's not always been the case. You know, you don't want to be elected to just necessarily be the person with the women's issues or whatever it is. You want a much more diverse portfolio of things that you're advocating because we're all diverse people. Um, and we have, you know, diverse experiences. And so I think, I think in particular, it's the lived experience. Um, the representation issue is huge. Um, I also think that how, speaking to the leadership and how women are different, you know, in order to even get to the, the, the halls of power in Congress, you have to build a broader coalition if you're a woman who is running, right? You're not just a pack with 10 major funders. You are building a broader coalition of people and you have to bring them along with you. You're used to building consensus. You have to build consensus in order to get to a position of power as a woman, right? There's a bit more humility that's expected. Um, and you know, it's this really difficult dance that I do think that many women have to walk between being ambitious and humble, leading, but not being too aggressive, being inclusive, and all of these things. But I do think women are able to master that really, really well. So I do think that's a piece of how women lead differently. And, and if they understand that their constituents have that lived experience and it's a priority for them, they're also gonna find a way to bring that forward. I think you said it so well. It's the same argument why diversity matters at any table extends to the policymaking table, right? That lived experience and, and the different ideas and you went to different schools or you, you know, it, it, it's the totality of the exact argument we make about why diversity overall matters. Um, but, and, and I smiled when you said like the, right, you have to be strong, but you need to be inclusive and ask everybody, but you have to have an opinion, but you need to make sure. It, and it's, it sounds, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's the reality. And this is the conversation that, you know, at part of um, women networking groups and all these conversations that you have among women, all of those things come up. And so having that balance, but it's where, how you bring it to the table. So I think you said it really well. So one of the challenges we've faced, this diversity around the room is incredibly important, and one of the challenges we've faced even in a corporate institute in the UK is about having diversity of age at the board making the decisions, and I think even this stands for people making legislation because it will be women of a certain age who've had a different life experience and perhaps be of family bearing or slightly older than that, and actually women from a more Generation Z they will have different needs and different requirements and it won't all be about childcare. It will be about how they're treated in a workplace, how the opportunities, and I think how the work is, how, how we work is changing for white colored workers in particular and how women are not blocked for progression because they uptake flexible working policies for whatever that reason happens to be. And I, and I think some of those things will also not just, so childcare is often something we focus on when we talk about why women don't progress as fast, miss out on career opportunities, why they have a slightly different experience in the workplace. But there are many other aspects that come to play. It's not just because people have children. That does set them back, but there are other issues at play too. And the expectation different, differential between the generations. You know, and, and right now we have such a mix of generations and the, the baby boomers are aging out of the workforce but and we're majority millennial now in the workforce. But you know, the 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 Z's are going to just expect entirely different. It's the same way they don't expect to see commercials on TV. They just have it totally different. My kids are Z's and, or no, the millennials and, and A, I guess. It, they have a totally different expectation of things in the world than 
I do as a Gen Xer. Like it's, and that's going to force change. And we're just at this tipping point right now with the multi generations. But age is a really good point. So, I'd like to open it up for questions soon, and I want to wrap with some final quick thoughts from each of you. Um, going back to that research that I mentioned earlier, currently fewer than half of Americans believe that we will achieve gender equality in our lifetime. And when you break that down, there is a very striking, albeit perhaps not surprising, gender gap with women being less likely to think that we are going to achieve gender equality in our lifetime. Rather than speculate, are we or are we not, right? I don't think that is the purpose of our discussion. I want to ask each of you, how specifically can we measure progress moving forward? It's a massive question. Yeah. Mallory, I mean, I it's a massive it was, question. I thought it was going to be... So I measure things quickly. for a living. You're giving me a good job to do now. <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about um, capital. Yes. So I think that um, one of the ways that we can, we can measure quite easily um, where we're at is how capital is moving. And I do actually think that's something that everybody can do. Um, and I'll say why in a second. So yes, we do have um, less than 3% of uh, investment capital going to women-led and founded businesses. It's even more dire, less than 1% for um, women of color. And it has gotten worse. Like if it could two years ago, three years ago have been bad, it's getting actually worse. Um, and so once we see that number move, um, we know that there's actually been structural ish, you know, changes in terms of how Silicon Valley and other investment um, companies and vehicles are thinking about the flow of capital. I think that's a major indicator. You certainly see the 2% is found literally everywhere, women's research, philanthropy, et cetera, and as an individual, you can think about how you invest your, even your 401k as an individual. Everyone in here has a 401k, and if it's $5 or $500,000, there is something that you can do to invest um, that those resources, that retirement package, in a way that will, by the way, probably give you higher returns. Um, so that's just one simple thing you can do. So I think capital flow is, is a huge one. So I wanted to bring that up. And then I just I want to stress again, once you hear more people who are being surveyed in a workplace reporting back that they find their workplace supportive, that it's more equitable, and it's more inclusive, and I don't know how you build a structure for that from a research perspective. <laughs> but those are three things. If you start to hear the majority of people say, of course, like we can measure positions and all of those other things, but like the reporting back of those three things, I think, is a measure of, of progress. And if we can get that up, we're going to see all of the numbers improve. There are a lot of fundamental things that are already measured. There are lots of organisations who put their own measurements in place for gender equality, not just in particular countries, but ac across a range of countries, the UN, um, World Bank, lots of them have this kind of structure in place. But ultimately it is about attitudinal change and perceptions that things have got better. Because all of those metrics, they may not just feel like they reflect the situation that an individual is experiencing. So I do concur with your point on surveying, obviously, the workforce. We bought a company last year called, um, it's our employee experience business, so we do now do employee experience research at scale across, you know, hundreds of thousands of employees across the world. Every company is still facing the same kind of challenges. There are very few that have cracked this when you look at the diversity and inclusion data, but also people's fear of speaking out comes across in much of the data too. So I think seeing some movement on those perception dials that we have within organisations will be a critical indicator that progress has been made. Yeah, so we, um, we have a campaign that we launched a year ago on International Women's Day to get to 35% of women in the sector by 2030. And so while not equality, I do think that becomes a tipping point because we will become, it will be so clear that women aren't an exception, right? It's not one in four, but it's, it's over, over a third. 
and that then fills and then how do we see that and and it's interesting because you, you right I said before it's it's well we're talking about gender and it's the biggest opportunity it's the biggest part of the population there's many levels of inclusion and underrepresentation the gaps that we need to fill so we've learned from other things and and as we um, and in the corporate response to George Floyd's murder and this outpouring of how do we make sure that we uh, deal with the the racial inequality gap there was a lot of conversation of yes it's not just about hiring uh, making sure there's opportunities and career pathways for people of color but there's opportunities at different levels and and so when you look at that and you look at gender, how do we make sure that we're not just saying, okay, we want a third of the hourly workforce. Well, that's not going to be the right, right? That's not going to be as per, um, pervasive or as deep of a change as making sure that variable levels within a company have better representation. And so our goal is to get to there and then from there build those supports, build that ecosystem in that community, which then will help others come up from behind. Because if you get that, you know, um, the, and the gap getting to 35% would fill actually our 800,000 job openings that we have right now, which is pretty substantial. So then when you do that and you arm up women in the sector to pull up the next people behind them, that's when you can double. And the thing, and Sarah, you mentioned this before, and I, I forgot to remark on it. When you talk about all these other changes that are happening, more women in the U.S. are going to college than men. So if you look at the jobs and the degrees of the future, now every job doesn't require a four-year degree, but you look at the opportunity for those with it, they are substantial. And so if we can build and lever on that and lever on that opportunity, you know, it, we can really make, make that impact. Thank you. Uh, Kelly is going to be walking around with a microphone. We have time for a few questions before we move into the mingling portion of the event. So if you've got a question, raise your hand high and Kelly will come around. Thank you, ladies. Um, Megan Olding, I'm an Australian Army officer currently stationed here in DC. So my question is more on the defence sector, but I think you'll have a perspective. Uh, I've been in the Army for nearly three decades and I've seen so much progression in terms of female progression in defence and, and security sectors. What I find it hard to do, though, is articulate why diversity matters in my area, in sort of strategic thinking, I quite often find myself the only female in the room. And when I talk to my male colleagues, and I talk about how important it is to have you know, diverse teams making decisions on, on national security, the question always comes back is why? So I find it really hard to articulate why it matters in terms of diversity. And I think uh, Obama is currently in Australia uh, on a series of of talks, he made, a, he made a comment which I found really interesting, that if all the leaders, the world leaders were female for two years, would solve all the issues of the world. <laughs> which is a really interesting comment, but how, like what suggestions could you provide when people ask me why it matters that diversity is in the room, how do you articulate why? So we always start with the um you have different ideas to what the challenges are and what the solutions are because you have a different set of experiences we talked about before. And so leading to that, and like McKinsey has got a good study that we use um, often to talk about diversity at the boardroom table, and so it, it would apply. Um, and if you think about the, the skill sets, right, you, you're, you're coming to it, and I'm, I'm thinking we run a military program as well, and, and where we've seen the biggest in, expansion of having gender, uh, having more women involved, is actually when we're talking about logistics careers, because that's a common MOS here in the U.S. for women going into the military. And yet you think about that experience set that you're coming to it, you're going to think differently about systems, differently about challenges. And if you only have people who have the exact same, you know, path that they've followed at that table, their view about what the challenges are and what the opportunities are is, is just so narrowed, right? It's like everyone has only read the same one book. And so there's tons, I would, I would lean on all of the rest of the DNI uh, like research that's out there to be able to say this is what it shows that you get more innovation, you get um, better culture, better inclusion, better all these things, but you also make more money, so that's on the corporate side, when you have more diversity and bringing that to the military side, you are dealing with systemic challenges in addition to like, 
you know, the supply chain challenges or logistics or frontline challenges, right? You have to deal with all the rest that comes around for taking care of the forces. And so bringing more people to the table with more ideas, like it, it's, it's kind of surprising, but it's not surprising because this is the conversation we're having all, all over. But I would look into the DE&I, particularly on the corporate side, and how that might help you. It is really sad that you're having to produce a business case for diversity at a senior level still in an organisation, just as a first point. And the second, that is the way to do it. Hopefully you would have a really livid example as well. We've put in place a shadow board and we're in the processes of finalising this in the UK at the minute so that we can get diversity of thought into our board setting from an age perspective because we are, if you look at our policies, they're mostly geared for those between the ages of 30 and 50. Guess what age our board is? Somewhere between, you know, 39 and 50 on average. And we're missing, and we have more attrition at junior levels. We will put in place. We're putting in place different policies for young, for younger people now because we can see through their eyes much more fully. But you need some really livid examples of where it's made a difference to have somebody with a diverse perspective in the room, and then that will become the thing that they hang on to. Brings it to life. Um, just real quick, we have we have a case study. I think philanthropy is littered with examples of a failure to diversify the decision making table, in particular the inclusion of women in strategy. So um, we use a particular case study by a major foundation that I won't name um, that decided that they were this particular seed was the just the most nutritious, tons packed with protein, all of the things. And they were going to use it um, in a, a country in Africa, and um, it was going to just change everything. It was going to improve nutritional outcomes. It was going to, because of that, kids would be healthier, so people would stay in school. And violence would reduce in the household, right? Because it would be more money. All of these things, right? Um, that didn't happen. Why? Because they didn't bring the right decision makers to the table. They just consulted with vill village elders, which happened to all be men. What they didn't understand in the community, you can see this all over the world, is that in many places, women are actually the farmers. They're the ones who are working into, in the fields. So what ended up happening was women had more work to do, so they actually ended up pulling their daughters out of school. Um, they didn't decide who was gonna use the money, right? So the men took the money. Now when you give you know, $10 to a woman, she's gonna keep eight or nine of it in the household. That's not the same for men. Tons of research around it, right? So what did the men do with the money? They started to take it to the black market or they went to the bar down the street, right? What happened then, there was tension and domestic violence increased in the household. So, so families are actually not safer. Um, they didn't retain the money. So nutritional levels didn't increase, and educational outcomes went down. That's just a classic example. You see it all the time um, in, in foreign aid and development type of projects, where you're not actually consulting all of the people who are going to be impacted by the decisions that you're making. So they don't work. And so it's like that leaky bucket argument. Like, how comfortable are you with the leak? Is it 60% of the money you're comfortable just leaking out of the bucket? Like imagine if you diversified your table, how much you'd be able to do and how, you know, that dollar would go that much further in terms of the work. I don't know if that's helpful, but we find your own example of something like that that can bring to life these statistics. Just one comment about the funding. Uh, I think the data is shocking. Less than 2% is going backward. Uh, one additional element is that 90% uh, of partners and board members or of the venture capital uh, industry are men. So you might think it's uh, bias. I don't think so. I think it's ignorance. Because if you look at the latest data from BCG, they analyzed 350 companies, startups, for one dollar invested in a we, in women led startups, there is the double of the return on investment. So, to be a good ally as a man to women, you need to do the homework and look at the data and trust the data. So true, so true. And, and I think that's in pattern recognition, right? Where you're like, 
you know, oh, this works, we know this works, and I, not doing the research, I couldn't agree more. So somewhat different questions. So given some of the, I don't know how to phrase it right, attacks on the LGBTQ um, community, particularly at the state, local levels, to some degree here in Washington, to what degree do you feel that that could cause a backlash or is a harbinger of kind of where things might go and what impact might they have ultimately rippling down to workplace um, gender equality issues? I have had some. I have heard on occasion that that is um, making this harder, and I think, and I, I kind of said this earlier, that I feel similarly to that that I do about the idea that um, the Me Too movement makes allyship harder. That's kind of a, a cop out. These are distinct issues, and there are challenges. There are common challenges for underrepresented groups, and common cause that can be found, and hopefully. Um, logic can prevail. I think, you know, I, I was talking optimistically before about progress that's been made. I think the, the um, conversation and the openness and the focus on culture that we're seeing, particularly in the workplace, is going to lead to real conversations about making sure that everybody can bring their whole selves to work and be their true selves, and that that is going to actually engender diverse ideas and thoughts and solutions and all of these things. And so how can we have um, create the environment that that can be positive, right? And and so I don't. It's it's certainly not an easy set of conversation. I don't know if that kind of addresses what what your question was, but you know, I've heard you know. Well, oh, well, it, it, this is all just getting to be too hard. Dealing with people and culture and inclusion is what's going to make companies successful and and our communities and our country successful. So hopefully, this just becomes the norm. It's actually going to the point earlier about. Um, other generations, I think there's a lot more acceptance and openness in the younger generations because this is more of the norm. And so that, that hopefully becomes a very positive upward influence, but it's, it's definitely tumultuous. I mean, I, I, th I think we're, we're all in this together, um, and I think we all should see this interconnected. I think hate has very long tentacles. And, and it is really hard to unloosen that grasp. And I see a direct connection between Roe and the backlash we're seeing around trans rights. It's all connected. Um, and it's, it, in, in the stifling of conversation, um, in just the public square, let alone the books and libraries and everything, it's just, it's gonna make all of this more difficult. This is part of the backlash of cultural change, and I think we'll get through it, but it's certainly gonna, I think in some, you're gonna see a growing disparity, I think, in this country between more progressive cities like DC um, and a city perhaps that's in the south, in Florida. You're gonna see a growing disparity, and, and if you're a company that's managing a global context, that's really, quite challenging, and we're seeing that like with Walgreens right now. Um, and I won't go too deep into that, I have a lot of feelings about it, but um, you know, it's really, really complicated on the corporate level, and, and so I, I'm, I have to say I'm really, really concerned. Um, and I do think that, that the, you know, we talk about in the feminist movements all the time about centering the margins, right? And I think, we have to do that in philanthropy, we have to do that in community building, in faith-based environments, uh, and we have to figure out how to continue to fight for that in the workplace, even as we're seeing all these cultural wars happening all over this country and globally. Hi. Oh. Go ahead. Um, I want to bring the topic back to childcare, and I would like to ask your opinion about something. So we talked about some of the issues that we talked about here such as the pay gap, the uh, not having enough women in workforce or in the C-suite. Most of those could be really correlated to lack of childcare, not having childcare. And we talked about what corporations, companies can do to help, right? What everyone can do. And one example that we now know is getting better is providing um, paternity leave. So that's, you know, in the right direction. So perhaps the next 
big thing that corporations can do is to provide um, some child support. That could be, what do you think about that? Do you think that could be the, um, I guess, uh, the next doable, practical solution that would make the biggest significant? And I don't mean necessarily, oh, every uh, corporation open a child care, but any support that could help out. So we from have, a practical perspective. Yeah, absolutely. We, and um, that's a, a great question. And it actually was something we're talking about more and more in, in our sector. And yeah, you know, we had a webinar a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago from uh, with four companies on it talking about what they're doing. And there's a big range, right? You've got uh, some companies who have on on campus their own center. You have some who, who have slots of emergency backup care. Some who are just subsidizing, here's your voucher, go do where you want. You have... Um, Others who are just okay. We're going to go in with another company in the in the town and open a whole facility. What's really interesting? I was talking about this with a, a multinational company who has locations all over the U.S. And they said they actually they they do have an on campus one in one of their states, and that is very well used by men and women who who are employed there. But they tried to do that in another state, and there was not interest from the employees because they wanted family to care. And so one of the things that they were tackling was the difference in preferences regionally was their experience but I think this is also among individuals of of, of how you want your care provided so that is something um, but we have examples in case studies helping other companies to pick up where can you provide for this there's also things like shift times if you for us we're shift work you know in, in a lot of facilities and so therefore what time you start and end to make sure that you're there for drop off at school or pick up for school that helps women come and stay maybe you want to schedule a time that you have a shorter shift in between so there's a lot of variations to the theme and companies are very eager to look at that but the one of the challenges is not just the cost it's the access because so many child care facilities closed during COVID and then when you look at the care economy the the wages for those folks they're not um, there are not as many child care centers here in the U.S. as there were going into COVID. So how do you deal with that? That is the supply side. But you have companies who are absolutely investing in. Uh, and companies are not just the big multinational, small companies that are looking at it too. And if that can become more persuasive or pervasive, but we have to match that with the offering, right? We have to have the ability for, com for, the, for the providers to be there and that that's we have to value that work as well and make sure that people feel like that is a worthwhile calling same as healthcare professions and so it, it runs deeper throughout mm -hmm. a couple of quick things just non-core working hours policies is something we introduced during covid and we've maintained it it means you can you don't have to work a set number of hours we used to make people come in between 10 and 3 was the core working hours but now it's much more flexible than that i think that's a cost free thing that employers can, can offer. And then I think there's a role for the state in this, if I'm honest. This is not just something employers can solve on their own without a very high cost. And actually, there's a role in both provide provision of childcare, standards of childcare, but there are tax free things that could be done. So, tax free vouchers is something that the state and employers in the UK were working together to provide. So, you get a tax free allowance, which you can use for childcare vouchers, but you choose your childcare. And when we moved offices in the UK, one of the things we thought about, do we want a canteen? Do we want a creche? What do we want? People didn't want the creche because actually they did not want to commute with their children into the office to put their children in a creche in the centre of London. It looks like we have one more question, so I want to jump in quickly. The, the last thing I'll say, Mina, is you know, we've done a lot of research around how employed people, particularly women in the workplace, value flexibility above all else. That, like gender equality in the workplace, is a very broad umbrella. And so I think there are steps that companies can and should take to understand what flexibility means to their employees at all life stages, and not just those who are parents, and not just those who may become parents one day. Um, so I think the question of flexibility is really important. We'll move quickly to our last, wait, Cliff? Yeah. Well, we did have somebody waiting to ask a final question, and then we'll wrap it up with you. Okay. 
Yeah. Hi, thank you all so much for, uh, for sharing your comments and experiences. Um, I wondered if you all could talk a little bit about kind of the intersection of class and gender equality in the workplace. Um, you know, I, with the rise of things like remote work, flexible schedules, like you were just talking about, Mallory, you know, how do we ensure that you know, gender equality is not just a benefit for white collar, college educated, you know, full time salary people, and it's something that's available to someone in any workplace? completely agree and that is very much uh, something we're focused on actually everything I talked about I'm I'm more focused on making sure there's flexibility and that we offer that and are addressing the the let's call it the the hourly and the production worker is probably the better way for me to say it versus the headquarter and office worker it's so most of my comments will go to that because we have to make sure that um, our very well-paying jobs or, but but our hour early in production are then taken care of. But I think you have raised a good point when it comes to the care economy and the service economy more broadly. And you saw just a whole swath of impact that was created by COVID and the closures that was entirely different than what we had in our sector. That's a great point. I think I'll just leave it there. That's a very good answer. We did, we did cover it a little bit in the Who Cares study, actually, which looked at uh, people with all different types of work schedules and demands on their time. And there are things that are employers can do to engage with some kind of flexible working policies but they are different types of flexible working policies they are shift work they are part-time work they're also job share work there are other things that you can engage in and also the, the timings at which individuals do their jobs so there's a whole range of things they're just different for different types of employment it's not too difficult to do something cliff any final thoughts yeah well first this is an awesome panel Thank you so much. And uh, okay, clap, clap. <laughs> I, I I do want to thank uh, a number of people because it takes a lot to put, to put together these events. And so, just stand up when I name you, Nicholas Boyan. Thank you so much, <laughs> Anna Dean, Kelly Falaji, Naj. I don't know if she's still here. And if I forgot anyone, er, anyone. Sure. Like, Oh, and, and Karen, too. She's outside. Um, I, I just want to make a point. Like the, I do have the mic, so I have the last thing. You're going to interrupt so, um, me? No, but I do want to make it just a general point, like a reflection. So I would say um, optimism. The trends seem to be going in the right direction. My caveat there is we live in a bubble. It's the tale of two Americas, which I'll come back to. Michael pointed out the backdrop or context which is extremely complicated. Sarah mentioned, spoke this as well. It won't be forever because as my grandmother always used to say, she was a social advocate, um, there's nothing that a good Christian burial can't resolve. And so we're going towards progress, but we're not quite there, right? Um, but you have this strong reaction, especially in the United States. I'm not quite sure as much in the UK, but we're in the middle of a cultural war here. Um, we're a federated system, so when these decisions are made at the Supreme Court level, the battles go on at the state level. So Dobbs was a big deal. And I just wanted to like, me, like an indicator to follow, maybe another point of optimism. Um, women are an important voting bloc. And I know this wasn't a political sort of panel. Um, it looks like they, women blunted a bit um, the, the advance of Republicans. That's debatable, but it looks like it. And I'm looking at them over the next 10 years as a voting block, as these issues become crystallized, because you can't separate one from the other. You can't separate Dobbs, re reproductive rights necessarily from all these other issues, right? They're a cluster of issues. And that's just, I just leave it at that. I, in my case as an analyst, that's what I'm looking at. 